In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the option of rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, we've been studying the book of Matthew, and we've studied Christ's resurrection. And we've also studied the fact that Christ uh, is the only person who uh, committed himself into the presence of heaven, the only person who uh, said... uh, uh, I commit. Uh, I can, uh, anyway, he uh, let himself uh, forget it. But we're studying resurrection, and that's because of the fact that uh, resurrection has only occurred for one person thus far, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we saw the resuscitation of the saints, and that's different. So we have the doctrine of resurrection, and there are two types of returns from the dead. First of all, we have resuscitation. That's completely different from resurrection. Resuscitation means a person returns from the dead in a body of corruption. And we've all heard of near-death experiences, and we've heard of people who have maybe been dead for two to five minutes, and they come back. Well, they were resuscitated not resurrected. And it has occurred, and that's where people come back and say, I saw a bright light, etc., etc. And uh, some of these things actually occur. Some of it is false, but some of it does actually occur in terms of resuscitation. And it's a miracle, and it does happen. But when it does happen, you come back in your body of corruption, meaning that uh, if you were to have a car accident and then be resuscitated, you're resuscitated back in your body of corruption and you still have an old sin nature and there's nothing really special about you except that the Lord gave you a miracle. And then eventually you die again for uh, once and for all. And uh, for example, we have Lazarus. And Lazarus is one who Jesus Christ brought back from the dead. And actually he said in the Greek, Duro exo! And he said it very Uh, plainly like that, and that means out, now. And Lazarus, who was dead, got up, probably unwrapped his death clothes as they did back then, just unraveled himself and walked right out to the amazement of everyone. And he had been dead for quite a while, but Jesus Christ resuscitated him, and he resuscitated him back to probably his peak state, And then eventually, later on, he died for good. The Apostle Paul, in fact, uh, died and went to heaven. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15. And then he came back and was resuscitated. There are two boys in the Old Testament who were resuscitated. One of them was by Elijah. And the little boy died, and then Elijah resuscitated him. Actually, God resuscitated him uh, through the agency of the prophet Elijah. Elijah and Moses in the tribulation will be resuscitated. Actually, they'll come uh, into the tribulation and they will have a lot to do with the witnessing during the tribulation. And then they'll uh, be killed, murdered actually. And then uh, they'll be resuscitated. And after they're resuscitated, they will blow fire out of their mouth and consume all of those who murdered them. A phenomenal thing that occurs in the tribulation. And, of course, we have the resuscitation of the Old Testament saints, which we studied in Matthew, the fact that uh, they were not resurrected. The earthquake occurred, and there was a resuscitation of Old Testament saints, and they walked the earth, and then uh, apparently they uh, just uh, dropped dead and went back to paradise after uh, they had made their return as uh, for a sign for Israel. Now, resurrection means that a person returns from the dead and they return in a body of incorruption. And when you're resurrected, you can't die. It's a, death is over. And when you're resurrected, and when, when you have your resurrected body, that resurrection body cannot die. 
And in fact, unbelievers will have a resurrection body. And that resurrection body cannot die. And you say, why would an unbeliever have a resurrection body? Well, at the end of all, at the end of the age, at the end of the millennium, they will go to the judgment, the last judgment, and they will be sent to hell on the basis of the, their, uh, plus, the fact that they have minus R when they should have plus R, which is righteousness. And all of their righteous deeds were as filthy rags. So they are cast into the lake of fire and they receive a resurrection body at the same time so that that resurrection body can handle the pain of hate hell, of the lake of fire. And, it's, and the fact is, uh, it's going to be so tremendous, they're going to need, the pain is going to be so tremendous, they're going to need a resurrected body to actually handle the pain. Once our bodies go through so much pain, we either pass out or usually we just pass out. If you catch on fire, and you, it's extraordinarily painful, but uh, before you die, you pass out. And uh, then you die because the body can't take that much pain. But the resurrected body of the unbeliever will be able to handle the pain without passing out, which makes it a, a terrible thing not to believe in Jesus Christ. Resurrection is the beginning of eternity for every person. Once we're resurrected, that is the beginning of eternity. Resurrection is one of the basic doctrines that all believers must understand for spiritual growth. That's found in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 2. And we might as well turn there. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. And there's uh, actually resurrection is mentioned once, but it's mentioned as an elementary doctrine. And a lot of people don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe the resurrection is going to occur. And the resurrection is imminent. It is going to occur. We don't know when. It could occur tonight at 9 o'clock, or it could occur 100 years from now, 200 years from now. None of us know, but the resurrection is imminent. The Apostle Paul said it could have happened in his day, but it didn't. And I say it could happen in my day, but it might or might not. No, None of us knows. And it may happen 500 years from now. And Hebrews 6, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of a change of mind from acts that lead to death, that means uh, get out of carnality. Stop living in carnality so that you can grow in grace and in knowledge. And of faith in God, that's a basic doctrine. Instruction about baptisms, basic doctrine. We've studied baptism. The laying on of hands, that was a basic doctrine for the pre-canon church age. And, it's, uh, and we'll study that when we go through Acts. The resurrection of the dead, a basic doctrine. And that's what we're studying now, the doctrine of resurrection, basic. But we haven't studied it, uh, not under me anyway, uh, since I've started. And eternal uh, judgment. And that, of course, is a basic doctrine. Now, anyone who dies during the church age, if we were to all die tonight and the resurrection hasn't occurred, we will have an interim body. And I know we'll have an interim body because of Revelation where it says we will be absent from the body and face to face with the Lord in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away. So the fact that we're face to face with the Lord, we don't have a resurrection body, but we have an interim body. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a body, but it's not going to be the resurrection body. And, and all of us are going to receive a resurrection body as believers, but it's going to be different for each one of us uh, depending on how far we went spiritually. For the one who uh, went all the way to spiritual maturity and went to play Roma to Thetu and executed the unique spiritual life, they're going to have the translucent uniform of glory. And they're going to be able to eat from the tree uh, in the, the garden of heaven. And they're going to have all types of uh, things that the others will not. And then we have, and that's why we have what they talk about in the Bible as the pearl. That's just the resurrection body. And some people will have that and that only, and nothing else to show for it. 
And that means they were losers, but at least they have their resurrection body. And that's the grace of God. Now, we will all have a resurrection body like that of Christ. And Christ has a resurrection body. And ours will will be similar to that of Jesus Christ's resurrection body. But uh, we won't all look exactly alike. There will be different types of resurrection bodies, depending, of course, on our success or our failure in executing the unique spiritual life and in our attitude toward the Word of God. The resurrection is mainly a New Testament doctrine. It is mentioned in the Old Testament, and while it's mentioned in the Old Testament, it did not occur historically until the Christocentric dispensations. That means it did not occur until uh, Jesus Christ was resurrected. And that's the first resurrection and the only that has occurred thus far. That is the Alpha Resurrection. No other resurrection has occurred since then. Only Jesus Christ has been resurrected. Now, uh, also, we noted, uh, as I noted earlier, Jesus Christ gave up his spirit, and he did it on his own volition. That's something that we can't do, because God has determined the time, the manner, and the place of our death. And uh, Jesus Christ uh, determined the time, place, and manner of his death, because he followed the plan of God, and then when he completed the plan of God, he said, Tetelestai, which means it is finished now with results that go on forever. He had finished the work on the cross, and make note, he had finished the work on the cross before he died physically. The work was done before he died physically. Secondarily, he simply said, Father, I commit my spirit to you, and he passed on physically. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he, that, that's something we can't do, and that's, that's what makes uh, Jesus Christ unique. And uh, we can commit suicide, of course, but that is, uh, anyone who commits suicide does not receive any spiritual rewards because they're a failure. And that's uh, an obvious way to note that they're a failure. But a believer who commits suicide still goes to heaven. And uh, a lot of people don't believe that, but... Saul committed suicide, and that very day he went to be with Samuel in paradise. So you can uh, be a believer in Christ and commit suicide. However, you will not receive any rewards if you do so, because it means you've been a loser as a believer. And so Jesus Christ is the only one who had the right to say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and therefore that is, it, that is his physical death. Now for us we have physical death, but for us it is uh, different. And we have control over our lives in terms of, do we want to live this spiritual life or not? You can say yes or you can say no, and that's the freedom that God gives each and every one of us. And that is a choice we can make, and we can have consistent, positive volition toward the Word of God, or we can say no way and forget it. And also, we can use our portfolio of invisible assets, which we've studied, but none of us has any control over the time, the manner, and the place of our death. None of us. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't eat right and exercise and all of that, but we still do not have any control over when we're going to die. And uh, a lot of times people will interview somebody 112 years old, and they'll say, how did you live to be 112? As if they had anything to do with it. As if they could have taken another breath without God knowing they would take another breath. But they'll say something like, well, uh, one person would say, I puffed on a cigar every day at 12 o'clock noon, and then I had a shot of brandy at 8 o'clock before I went to sleep. And I did that routine for the last 30 years, and that's why I've lived to be 112. And they look all frail, and it looks like they wish they want to die anyway. And so uh, they'll give some stupid example like that, and that's just plain arrogance because um, God determines the time, the manner, and the place of our death. And if someone lives to be 112, it's probably because they had a great humility in their youth and followed the instructions of their parents. Therefore, the promise for them was fulfilled. So none of us has control over the time, the manner, or place of our physical death. We cannot prolong our life, nor can we cut our life short. 
But you say, what about suicide? Well, there's been stories of some people who've tried to commit suicide and they just couldn't do it. Man jumps off a bridge, or a man, a man has even shot himself in the head, jumped off, off, jumped off a bridge into a lake, and still survived. Well, that was uh, God didn't want him to die right then. And uh, even though it, it would seem like uh, somebody like that would just drop dead from a bullet going through the brain, some people have tried to commit suicide and it hasn't worked. And uh, sometimes people commit suicide and God simply allows it and, from his permissive will and says, all right, you want to commit suicide, go ahead. And uh, if they're a believer, they go to heaven. If they're not a believer, they go to hell. Uh, but it, that was uh, God's timing either way because he allowed it. So the death of the believer is always a matter of wisdom. So we should never question the death of any fellow believer. That's God's wisdom. And God has determined the time, the manner, and place of everyone's death. And so for us to question why someone has died, and of course it's heartbreaking, but for us to question God and say, why did you let this happen now? Why did this person leave me now? For you to do that, you have, well, you don't understand the wisdom of God and the fact that he has determined the time, place, and manner of that person's death in eternity past. And that's the wisdom of God. And it's the integrity of God. And it's the sovereignty of God. And to question that is to move into blasphemy. But all of us have a tendency to do that uh, when we lose a loved one because it's so heartbreaking. And because it uh, is so emotional for us. But it's still wrong. And, and what, the more doctrine we know, the easier it is to get through times like that, even though we will still weep. And we will still remember that person. It'd be a lot easier to get through it because you have the doctrine to realize that was God's perfect wisdom. That person left the earth under God's perfect wisdom and perfect timing. And our timing is not perfect, but His timing is. Apart from the resurrection of the church, all of us are going to die. Now, if the resurrection were to occur within the next uh, five to ten minutes, then. Uh, None of us would die, and we would all just simply uh, just uh, transfer from this body into our resurrection body. That's for one generation only. Whether it be ours or not, we don't know. But apart from the resurrection of the church, all believers are going to experience physical death. All of us are going to die. Happy Halloween. And the matter of our physical death is a matter of divine wisdom. And it has nothing to do with our decisions. It's a matter of God's decision. It's a matter of God's omniscience. And the death of the believer is always God's victory. So when a believer dies, God has just uh, had a victory. And the angels in heaven stand up and cheer as the person uh, moves into heaven. And that is God's victory. And the type of believer really makes no difference. Every believer goes to heaven, winner or loser, when they die. And you might be a loser believer, and you might die tomorrow, and you're still going to go to heaven. And there's going to be no distinction until the Bema. And the Bema is the evaluation throne of Christ, and that doesn't occur until the tribulation. We won't be here for the tribulation. We'll be uh, in heaven being evaluated. We'll be having our very own little tribulation probably for some of us. Because our Lord Jesus Christ is going to say, What did you do with the unique spiritual life? You were given an opportunity to learn it. Did you learn it? Did you execute it? Did you uh, follow under grace? Or did you become a legalist? Did you follow under grace? Or did you go and raise hell and say, Goodbye, I'll see you in eternity, Father? Which one did you do? And you're going to have to answer for that at the Bema, at the, uh, and that is immediately after the resurrection. And that's when we receive our rewards, and that's when we receive uh, great differences. The winners will have a great, there will be a great difference between the winners and the losers. And there will be a great majority of losers and very few winners, and there will be, and those very few winners will be very distinct from all the losers. And then in the millennium, they'll get to reign with Christ for a thousand years. And there'll be nationalism in the millennium. There'll be Israel and there'll be other nations 
It might not be set up the way it is today, but there'll be other nations. And if you succeed in the unique spiritual life, uh, God the Father, or Jesus Christ actually, at the evaluation, and just after following the evaluation, he'll say, uh, so-and-so, you will rule in North Africa. And then you'll be a winner ruling in North Africa. And then someone else, you are a winner, you will rule in Asia. And then someone else who has executed the spiritual life. Maybe he'll say, Apostle Paul, you will be my vice president in Israel, etc. And there'll be great honors bestowed upon those who have executed the unique spiritual life. But either way, the death of the believer, winner or loser, is always God's victory. And it makes no difference if you're a winner or a loser. If you're a believer, it's God's victory. Winners, or invisible heroes, can die in one of two ways. You can be a winner and you can die in one of two ways. Just because you're a winner believer doesn't mean that you're going to have a painless death. You may execute the plan of God perfectly. And you, well not perfectly, none of us is perfect, but we may go very far in the spiritual life. And then it comes time for our uh, going through the valley of the shadow of death and then passing on into eternity. Now it could be very painful and very prolonged. That's one category. And you say, why would that happen to someone who's a mature believer? Well, because they would probably become, not probably, but very definitely become a witness to all those who see them. And the people who see them going through the tremendous pain and the prolonged misery, and the people who see that and see the person handle it with uh, understanding that it's God's timing, and seeing the people handle it without being scared. And, and some doctors have even come to believe in Christ by watching a mature believer go through death and uh, that believer never even once was scared, never even once had uh, sweaty palms. Just went right through it, and uh, it was very painful, maybe something like cancer, and just uh, went right through the thing and died almost with a smile on their face, even though it was painful because they had the Word of God in their soul. And that's why, so that it would leave behind a testimony. And then the doctor would take note of it or something and say, well, I want to go to this person's funeral because I've never seen anyone handle death like that before. And they go to the funeral and the pastor gives a, gets up and gives the salvation message and boom, he's saved and says, I want that contentment. And uh, also, you could be a, a winner believer and you could die quickly and painlessly. You could be a winter believer and you could live up to be 90 years old and you could go to sleep on a Thursday night and never wake up. And just go to sleep and wake up in the presence of the Lord. No pain. Something that's very quick. Or you could be uh, 27 years old and run head on into a, a truck and die instantly. No pain. And then boom, up to heaven you go. You could die that way, uh, but uh, it's still God's victory either way, and the mature believer can die that way. And in the same way, the person, the believer who is a loser, the, the believer who did not take seriously the spiritual life, they could die a prolonged death, and they could die a death that has involved with it a lot of pain. But when that loser dies, it's still God's victory. Or the loser believer could die in a car accident immediately with no pain involved, just an immediate death. Or they could die in their sleep, the loser believer dying in their sleep. Either way, it's still God's victory. So the principle is we can never really uh, judge, and we never should judge, especially someone's death because we just do not know, and we might have an idea about it. And 1 John chapter 5 uh, indicates that we should have an idea about the spiritual life and the fact that some people die the sin face to face with death. And not just some, but most believers die the sin face to face with death. But that is not for us to judge. And, uh, of course, we have discernment, but it's not for us to judge. 
And once they die, it's God's victory. So after they're in heaven, just uh, shut your mouth. Don't say anything else about it. They're in glory forever and ever. And it's none of our business whether someone has died, a winner or a loser. We have enough uh, difficulty living our own spiritual lives. And uh, so maybe they were a loser and maybe they were a winner. We just don't know. And uh, sometimes we do know, and if we do know, we just don't say anything about it. So the manner of our physical death is determined by the wisdom of God. And that is why we as believers should not mourn as those who have no hope. And that's, of course, found in Scripture. And sometimes death, uh, some of the most horrible uh, experiences for families to go through is an accidental death, something that's shocking and not even, uh, they weren't even thinking about it. Someone who has been very ill for the past three years and they pass away, well, you've probably been preparing yourself. But someone who you very healthy, very strong, very handsome, very beautiful, suddenly dies on you, and it's accidental. A lot of times, people like to, that is when people really lose it and say, uh, "Why did God let this happen?" And and it doesn't matter how accidental it might appear, or it and it doesn't matter if it seems that someone was negligent or at fault. I remember uh, at Baraka Church one time, a little girl named Valerie. I think she was about seven, eight, or nine, somewhere in there, six. Well, she had believed in Christ, and there's a little pamphlet on it. I don't know if we have it over there. We should. It's called Valerie's Victory, and it tells all about it. And she was out in the uh, parking lot of Baraka Church, and uh, somebody uh, backed up their car and ran over, and she died. And, and uh, the family handled it very well, and it's all in that pamphlet. And there was no blame, and there was no, why didn't you look behind you? And there was no, uh, we're going to sue you, you were negligent. There was none of that, because they had determined that, well, this was an accidental thing, and it was God's timing, and God's timing is perfect. And they didn't fall apart. And they uh, didn't fall apart because they knew that their little girl was in heaven, even though it was accidental, even though it uh, ripped their world apart. And But they still used doctrine in the situation and did not lash out, did not uh, blame anyone and sh- that they should be negligent or at fault. And that's because the death of anyone is God's timing. It was God's timing for that little girl named Valerie. And it's God's timing for us, whether it be an accident or whether it be a prolonged thing in which we know we have cancer and we're dying or heart disease or something else. And it it doesn't really matter because it's all wrapped up in God's wisdom. So we have no right whatsoever to be bitter. We have no right to be vindictive. Sometimes when people die, they want to blame somebody. If they don't blame God, they blame somebody else. A lot of times they just blame God. God, why did you let this happen? But in something like a car accident, they want to blame somebody else. And especially in cases where it was a a, a drunk driving accident or something like that, they really want to blame the drunk driver. And uh, he is culpable under the law and should face the tremendous penalties that the law has for him But for the person who's gone through it, they should not be bitter toward that man. He's going to be punished under the law or the woman, whoever has uh, had the drunk driving incident. And that occurs a lot. And what happens is uh, people get so shattered by that, they blame that one person their whole life, and they have hatred for that one drunk person their whole life. And that person might not be too bad a fellow. He just made a... uh, a bad decision in air, a bad decision in judgment one night, and they came home from a club or something else, and uh, it ended up in a car accident, and somebody died, and then he gets up for uh, I don't know what they call it. I'm sure Brad does, but uh, it's a uh, reckless homicide, and they can spend years and years and years and years in jail, and they're going to pay for it, and they deserve it, and they they deserve it because they should have used their head. But that doesn't give the right of the victim to be bitter. And you should never be bitter because bitterness takes you out of fellowship. Even in murder cases, 
Bitterness will take you out of fellowship. And in murder cases, the law should deal with the murderer, and the murderer should be executed. And it doesn't happen often under our law, although it should, and it did in the past. But still, we have no right to be uh, bitter, and we have no right to start a vigilante or vigilante type movement in which we uh, send somebody, for example, somebody kills our child, and we get all up in arms and say, well, I'm going to kill that uh, SOB. And you go in the courtroom with a gun and kill him. Well, that's vigilante, and now you're guilty of murder, and now you're going to jail. And you've solved nothing. And you have no right to be bitter, because if the law doesn't handle that uh, murderer, let me tell you something, you leave it in the hands of the Lord, and he'll handle them. And he'll make sure he handles them, because as our Lord said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And God the Father will make sure that uh, judgment will come. And we always have to remember, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And we should never try to have revenge against somebody or have payback. What did we watch the other night, Dallas? And it was all about payback. Diary of a Mad Black Woman. And uh, first, first of all, the woman starts out real sweet. And her husband's a jerk. I mean a real jerk. And uh, he leaves her and throws her out. And, and, and she, after a while, she gets bitter about it. And she thinks about it, and the more she thinks about it, she gets madder and madder and madder. And there's a lot of principles out of that movie, Diary of a Mad Black Woman. You wouldn't think so, but there are. And uh, her mother comes along and says, Hey, uh, you need to leave this in the Lord's hands. God can deal with this person a lot better than you can. And then uh, the big fat black lady says, uh, says uh, Well, he ain't working fast enough. And then she says, Well, look here in the Bible. It says, uh, Jesus said, peace be still. And then she said, I got a peace. And she pulls out a gun. And she said, peace is still when I pull out this gun. And it's just, it's really a funny movie. But then uh, what happens is this real sweet, uh, she starts out real sweet. But then the guy gets shot in a courtroom at her husband, who has been so cruel to her. And uh, so she goes back and apparently to take care of him. But while, she te while she's taking care of him, she gets very bitter toward him because he doesn't even change. And he's still calling her names while he's sitting there like an invalid. So she just throws him into the uh, bathtub, etc. He's almost drowning, drowning, and she's just laughing at him. Ah, ha, ha, ha. And then she'll pull him, up, pull him up to the dinner table and eat in front of him and say, Are you hungry? Ha, 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 ha. So that's all part of bitterness. And she became very bitter uh, because of what had happened to her, and so she sought revenge. But we all must remember, just as she should have remembered, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And he'll do a lot better than we can, even though we don't see it happening right off and we want it to happen immediately. God will take care of the circumstance. We studied that under the fourth stage of the faith rest drill having to do with the fact that you leave it at the Supreme Court of Heaven and He'll take care of it. And don't you worry about it. And the same applies in death that we should not become bitter. Not when we're dying or not when anyone of our loved one dies. We should never become bitter. And we should never judge a fellow believer who has passed on because it is not subject to either judging or speculation once he goes on to be with the Lord. And you say, well, why? Because it's God's victory. If he, if he or she is a believer, it's God's victory. And uh, the old things have passed away, and it's not up for us to speculate about. Uh, we might know uh, in terms, because we know the doctrine, we might know what all happened and what was all involved, but you keep it to yourself. Because either way, it was God's victory. And uh, if it was, uh, and if the death was the sin unto death, you definitely don't want to talk about it because of the fact that, uh, uh, remember, triple compound discipline. How do you get uh, triple death? I don't know. It must be awful horrible, so you better not do it. And that's the whole principle behind it. Every genera generation of believers in the Old Testament died a physical death. Moses had a dramatic death. He climbed up on top of the mountain, and the Lord took him. 
and drop dead there. And then there's a whole other thing that happened after that. Satan and uh, Gabriel started to fight over the body. Or Satan and one of the angels started to fight over the body. And uh, the angel won out, of course. But Satan was trying to start a religion around Moses. That didn't work out for Satan. And then we have Elijah. And he uh, rode to heaven in a, a special uh, convoy. Uh, our Lord just came down and got him, and he rode to heaven. Uh, but there was no resurrection in the Old Testament, and that wasn't Elijah's resurrection. The Lord just came and got him, and somewhere between uh, earth and heaven, his body disintegrated, and his soul just kept going, and there was no pain involved for Elijah. He had a special death, just as Moses had a special death. And there could not be a resurrection in the Old Testament because the first resurrection in all of history occurred with Jesus Christ and this occurred during the great power experiment or the protocol spiritual or prototype spiritual life. Remember Jesus Christ lived the prototype spiritual life and he was resurrected. And it was the power of God the Holy Spirit that resurrected him. And we have been and made available to us as that same power. He was first to be resurrected. Who's resurrected next? The church age. And then all of us will be resurrected. And we've been given the very power of resurrection that was given to our Lord Jesus Christ and the very power of the unique spiritual life all of which we've studied in detail. So death is actually one of the greatest expressions of the grace of God. The time of our physical death is a wise decision from the sovereignty of God. And He doesn't keep us here beyond His point of wisdom. When it's time for us to go, we're going. And if it's not time for us to go, no matter what happens, we're not going. And he does not take us home before his point of wisdom. So again, this principle. He doesn't keep us here beyond his point of wisdom. And he does not take us home before his point of wisdom. So whenever he dies, it's his point of wisdom. Therefore, death is something we should not fear. It's God's wisdom. Why would you fear God's wisdom? And the only thing death is for the believer is we leave the, live this body of corruption and go to be face to face with the Lord in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away and we move into eternity where everyone is happy forever and ever. Why is that something to be scared of? Well, Satan has uh, designed his own system in which uh, people are scared of death. So God is perfect, His wisdom is perfect, His decisions are perfect, and God decides the, t the time, manner, and death of each of us, and uh, therefore it is a point that we can utilize, it's a point of doctrine that we can utilize as Job did, and Job had a large family, he had a wife and he had a lot of children, and his children were swept away in a tornado, a, a terrible storm came up and uh, a tornado was involved, and all of his children were killed. And what did Job do? Did he become bitter? Because it wouldn't seem like a terrible accident. I mean, his children are young and vibrant. They've been having parties, and they've been enjoying themselves. And then suddenly, boom, they're gone, taken away by a tornado. Well, what does he say? Does he say, God, why'd you do that? Or, I, or did he fall, feel sorry for himself and just fall all apart? No. He said, the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He applied doctrine. And that's an Old Testament saint applying doctrine. And he knew he would see his children again when he died. And of course he was upset about it, and of course he probably shed some tears about it. It was part of his evidence testing. But his, his attitude was the Lord gave. The Lord gave him those children, and the Lord took away those children. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not only did he take away his children, but he took away all of his wealth. He was the wealthiest man in the world and went to one of the most poor men in the world. And he had great health. 
And then he ended up with the most terrible health in the world and was scraping boils with glass and was in tremendous agony. And he lost his health and he lost his children and uh, he may have lost his wife. There, there's no... Uh, she did... Well, she lost his wife. Well, it wouldn't matter if he, lo- if, she, if he lost his wife or not because she became a real snarl to him because she told him, Why do you hang... Because you know what he said. He said, The Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then his wife became very bitter and said, Why do you hang on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? And she said that looking at him with all his boils on his face. He was already having a rough time. And then all his best friends came around and picked on him and and told him he must have committed a terrible sin. So he was really under a severe test called evidence testing. Yet he passed it. And a part of his attitude was the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Also, we can claim a promise. Romans 8, 38 through 39. And you can turn there if you wish. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Now we're studying death and resurrection because this is what our Lord Jesus Christ just went through. He went through physical death and then He went through a resurrection. We too, if the resurrection doesn't occur in this generation, will go through physical death and then we will go through resurrection and we will follow the exact pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 8, 38 through 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So death does not separate us from the love of God. For I am persuaded that neither death. And when we die, we're still under the love of God as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our soul simply leaves our body and goes to heaven. What's there to be scared of? You scared of pain? Well, uh, your body can only take so much pain. And I can understand not wanting to go through pain. But uh, so what? You can utilize the spiritual life going through pain. But death? What's there to be scared of? Your body, uh, your soul will simply leave your body and you go into the presence of the Lord. And uh, even though your body goes to sleep, you don't. And even when you're sleeping, your soul's still awake. We know that because we have dreams and all sorts of things. And so the body goes to sleep and we go to heaven. And that's what that is the analogy of going to going to sleep. And death does not separate us from the love of God. In fact, this is an eternal security verse. Nothing can separate us from the love of God when we believe in Jesus Christ. Death can't. Angels can't. Principalities and powers deals with uh, the satanic principalities and powers. Deals with Satan and his demon armies. They can't even separate us from the love of God, even if we follow in their cosmic system. Even if we screw up and follow Satan's cosmic system, that power cannot separate us from the love of God if we believed in Christ. Nor things present, nothing going on right now, can separate us from the love of God. Nor things to come, whatever's going to happen in the future, whether it be good or bad, it's not going to separate us from the love of God. Nor height nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Any other creature includes ourselves. We cannot separate ourselves from the love of God. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive phileo in the Greek. That's God's personal love. And therefore, we cannot lose our salvation and death cannot even separate us from the love of God. Psalms. 116.15 116.15 says this. Psalms 116.15 Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Who is a saint? Do you have to be good to be a saint? No. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a saint. 
1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9 makes it very clear that we're part of the royal family of God. And we are saints. So every time you read in the Bible where it says saints, well, it's talking about anyone who's believed in Jesus Christ. And David was a saint. And you sitting here today, even though we're not stupid and we don't run around calling ourselves saints, we're saints. I'm St. Andrew. Hello, how are you? And you are saints, everybody else. And we're all saints. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints, winner or loser. There's no distinction. And you could be a loser as a saint. You could be a loser saint. So what? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Philippians 1, 20 through 21. Philippians 1, 20 through 21. Now, this is dealing with the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is, of course, a winner believer. And this is his view on death. And it's his view and his uh, competent expectation, etc. Philippians 1, 20 through 21. And the Apostle Paul, of course, one of the great greatest believers ever, if not the greatest believer ever, uh, although all of us have equal privilege and equal opportunity to go just as far as the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul was a genius, one of the greatest believers ever, and this is his attitude toward death. <clears throat> On the basis of my competent expectation and hope. Hope, of course, is elpis in the Greek, and it means absolute confidence. Hope is absolute confidence in the Greek because of Elpis and uh, when we have hope in the English we say I hope so you go up to somebody and say are you going to heaven and they, I, and they say I hope so it means there's some doubt behind it but this word has no doubt behind it it's Elpis meaning confidence on the basis of my confident expectation and absolute confidence that I shall not be put to shame in anything. This has to do with shame in a resurrection body. This has to do with the fact that the Apostle Paul knows that he's a winner and knows that he is not going to be put to shame in his resurrection body. But in all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, that is through him living the unique spiritual life, through being filled with God the Holy Spirit, through executing the spiritual life by utilizing the ten problem-solving devices, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics, by executing the spiritual life, he shall be exalted in his body. Now, our bodies, without the filling of God the Holy Spirit, is in sin. And in carnality. And as an unbeliever, your body is always in sin. So you can't exalt anything as an unbeliever. But as a believer, through the filling of God the Holy Spirit, Christ shall now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. In other words, death is part of living. Life and death, uh, actually, the Apostle Paul makes really no distinction between it except this. For me, and this is an elative conclusion, and meaning there's no verb. He became very, well, actually this is elliptical. It's not the elative conclusion. This is elliptical, meaning he's uh, taken out the verb. And the verb is put in there in the English so we can understand it. But uh, uh, when he takes out the verb, it comes out like this. For me, living Christ, dying prophet. And that's how it comes out in the Greek. And of course we have, for me living is Christ and dying is prophet. That smooths it out a bit. But, uh, for example, if uh, your mother tells you, uh, Jimmy, go to the store. Or, uh, or, or uh, let's see, how should it go? Uh, Jimmy, you should go to the store. And then uh, you're sitting there watching TV and you don't listen. And, and so after a while she gets... Uh, a little upset with you. Jimmy, go to the store. And then after that, uh, finally, it just gets elliptical, and she finally says, To the store! And then you hop up from the TV and go to the store, like you were told to. And this is the Apostle Paul getting elliptical. For me, living Christ and dying prophet. That is how every 
mature believer should look at death. And actually, I would like that on my gravestone if I have one. I'm going to be cremated. But uh, whatever, whatever they put my ashes, ashes in, I want this phrase there. For me, living Christ and dying prophet. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study resurrection and the physical death of the believer so that we might come to understand that there is nothing to fear when it comes to death and that we should understand that when we live our unique spiritual lives that living is Christ and dying is profit. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.